Yes, folks, this isn't any cheap X-rated movie or any fifth-rate porno play. This is the show you want. Lady Divine's Cavalcade of Perversions. The sleaziest show on earth. Not actors, not paid imposters, but real, actual filth. Who have been carefully screened in order to present to you the most flagrant violation of natural law known to man. Fish. You're sick and repulsive! Oh, you, my dear, are dead! <laughs> Everybody. Thank you. John Waters. Thank you. John, thank you so much for being here, and thank you so much for re-releasing Multiple Maniacs yeah. so that my eyeballs could see it for the first time. <laughs> right, I know. I couldn't see it. I said, I have that ashtray. I never knew it was in that movie once they restored it. Well, that actually brings me right to my first question. Outside of all of the lunacy that takes place in the movie that I, I, I want to touch on, I'm curious what you thought when you went back and watched it, what you think sort of of those memories, of those friends, of all these people, that, the Dreamlanders that you were working with, what it conjures up for you. Because it's one thing for a person to watch home movies. It's another thing for a person to watch that as a home movie. Well, these are my home movies. Yeah. That's the problem. Uh, when I remembered it, it was certainly square. It was 16 millimeters. You could see every splice mark because it was done with an old hot splicer. The sound was recorded right on the magnetic stripe on the film because it was shot on a camera. This before video that they used for, to shoot the news. So I had a memory of it. And then when I went in and they showed me what they could do with restoration, I said, like, they said, do you want to keep us? Do you want us to restore every bit of dirt, everything? I said, no, I never wanted it to look like that. I just didn't know what I was doing. So let's make it look as good as we can. Let's so, make it look like you knew like, what you were doing. Like a bad John Cassavetes movie, which <laughs> it looks like now. And I'm really happy about that. It's been a long journey to a bad, <laughs> bad John Cassavetes movie from Multiple Maniacs. What about your headspace at the time that you made this, the headspace of the Dreamlanders, what you guys were trying to achieve or even maybe thought you were achieving? The first screening of this new restored version was in the Provincetown Film Festival, and the first comment I had was as I walked out, a member of the audience said, that acid must have been pretty good then. <laughs> <laughs> and he was right. Yeah. <laughs> it's, but what's different about, I think, your version of acid, I think, and a lot of other movie versions of acid, is that you have a wicked sense of humor on acid. And we always funny. laughed when we tripped, so we <laughs> cried. Uh, I think this was a movie that I was trying to make exploitation films for art theaters, which, where I grew up in Baltimore, where the Ingmar, Bergman, Ingmar Bergman's movies were released as sex pictures. They would, they would cut out the dialogue and leave the tits in, you know? And, yeah, and Ingmar Bergman had puke. He always had puke in his movies. So he was the puke king, not me. He always had puke, and that was a big influence on me as a child. And even to this day, you should know, cream corn makes great puke in black and white. Yeah. <laughs> and foaming at the mouth, it's just an Alka-Seltzer without water. It works every time. So in, in, in many ways, this was your sort of uh, your interpretation or sort of reimagining of Igmar Bergman. Yes, this is my Bergman-esque film. Woody Allen made interiors. I made multiple maniacs. You made a lobster rape. <laughs> yeah, well, a lobster rape. Everybody said, well, that, where did that come from? It seemed perfectly natural to me. It, it, aren't we glad we don't have test screenings today? Can you imagine the focus groups who say, well, where did that lobster come from? Well, to me, it makes perfect sense. Divine's going crazy. He wants to be a monster. He gets raped by a lobster, which pushes him over to the edge of insanity, where he's finally divine, and he's a monster like Godzilla, and he's killed by the National Guard. That is per perfectly makes sense to me. That's some good acid, then, Joe. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, talk about this sort of idea of an art house exploitation film. Were you aware at the time that that was something that didn't exist and you could sort of fill that niche? Were you even thinking of it in that way? Yeah, it became that with all the Swedish movies like Iowa Woman, 491, uh, all those kind of movies, Drez and Isabel, they all were kind of shockers that, that, that push the boundaries of sex in an artistic way, which meant black and white with subtitles. <laughs> if you had subtitles, you could be much dirtier. And if you served really espresso coffee in the theater, you could get away with a lot, because then it was an art film. So today, I mean, this is opening in an art theater still. It's opening at the IFC, which is where Hairspray opened. The last time I ever appeared with the Vine was there. So um, it's, I'm thrilled. It was called the Waverly then when I was young. But um, So certainly, I grew up going one night to the drive-in and seeing Herschel Gordon Lewis's 2000 Maniacs, and the next night to see uh, Ingmar Bergman movie. So to me, they were both extreme, and, and they both changed censorship. The foreign films at the time were the ones that broke all the censorship laws because they were artistic. So I wanted to make a monster movie, and this is a monster movie. And Divine was never transgender. Div Divine never walked around dressed as a woman. He didn't want to be a woman. As I always said, he wanted to be Godzilla. And I think this was the closest he ever got. And he scared people in Pink Flamingos. This was trainers with, he, he eats an old cow's heart in this and then eats shit in Pink Flamingos. And we stopped there, really. It was a, it was a natural, no organic journey, really. Where else could you go after that? Well, to a snuff movie, and we decided that wouldn't be a good idea. What do you think about the fact that uh, the re-release of this movie in many ways uh, makes sense against political correctness because of the context of who you are and the career that you have developed. Whereas if a young filmmaker that nobody knew released this movie today, people would find it very offensive and politically incorrect. I think I've always been politically correct. I would argue the point of that. I think every one of my movies is politically correct. But however, you are watching Multiple Maniacs in a time zone. You're watching it in a time capsule. Yes, Divine talks about killing cops in there in a humorous way. That would never happen today. Then people said off the pigs all the time. It was a rallying cry and everything, which is shocking when you look back on it. But today, no group, no matter how radical, would say that today. So, but you're watching this in a way that makes people uneasy but kind of laughing because it is now so politically incorrect but you can't really fault me for that because it was made 50 years ago so it's you're watching it in a time zone with people that you've seen in my movies if you've seen my other movies you've grown old with I mean Mink Stoll's been in every one of my movies from you know I just she came to Provincetown last week and we sort of celebrated our 50th year of friendship so um, it, it I think it's because it's in a time warp it's getting much more intellectual Actual reviews. It got all terrible reviews when it came out, but we use those reviews, like bad reviews. The whole campaign was based on that. Worse than the Conqueror Worm. That was one I remember. And I never saw the Conqueror Worm, but I bet it's good. It sounds, it's, yeah, it's yeah, a good title. Yeah. yeah. Uh, your, your method for getting people to see this is interesting and is a real testament to how movies could develop an audience at that time, which is essentially, right, you had the film, the print of the film in the in the trunk of your car, and you drove it around the country to midnight movie houses. Well, they weren't even movie, midnight movie houses. I would talk them into just renting me the space for, like, they'd maybe say 200 bucks, and I'd rent the thing, and if no one came, I would have lost 200 bucks, but I got to keep the money if they came. So um, I learned really a lot from doing that, but I got some weird little distribution deals from uh, the filmmakers cooperative, Jonas Meek, from Underground Cinema 12, which was a guy named Mike Getz in California. And, and I paid my father back this movie. He never saw it. He didn't, he, you know, it was the opposite of pitching a movie today. If I had told him what it was about, I wouldn't have gotten the deal. So, um, but he, I did pay him back. And um, so I did learn a lot about how to distribute a movie by, by doing it myself. And Divine sometimes would come with me and stand on the corner and give out flyers. And people would be frightened when they'd see us. They should have been, really. <laughs> you said that before. People should have been frightened. By well, kind of. Only we were totally harmless. But people, I remember, would take the flyers and throw it back and say, do you have LSD on here? They would think that we were like, I don't know what. They didn't know what we were doing. Yeah. How serious did you take yourself as an, as an artist at the time oh, when you were making these I, movies? I called myself, this was advertised as a celluloid atrocity, so I wouldn't say that seriously. 
Um, I, I never liked, when anybody says to me, I'm an artist, I would say, oh, really? I think I'll be the judge of that. Um, or history will be the judge of that. So I think it's not up to me. I've never called myself an artist. I called myself a filmmaker. I thought I had a good sense of humor about it. Uh, when I was called the Prince of Puke and the, all those titles, I accepted them with happiness. Uh, my favorite one was the People's Pervert. I got that one recently. I thought that sounded good. So. Um, I was, they were always said in a spirit of good humor, I think. But the negative reviews we got, um, we used. And that would be almost be impossible to happen today because then the critics fell for the bait. Today, they really wouldn't if they hated it. You know what I mean? They would dismiss it, but they wouldn't come out and say, this has to be stopped or what Rex Reed always did. There isn't that kind of conservative furor over the, over the, the or fury over things that they don't like. Well, only because they didn't see it. I mean, I, I can imagine the Catholic League wouldn't be thrilled if they saw it, but I, I wish he would see it. Can we talk about why the Catholic League, for those who haven't seen it, why they might not be thrilled? Well, there's a rosary job in it, which is... It's hard to explain, but it involves rosaries and the Stations of the Cross and a sexual release at the moment of crucifixion. For an extended... For a long time. Right. It's, <laughs> it's, it's no <laughs> quickie. And, uh, and Jesus pukes on the cross at the end. Well, we all have bad nights. Oh, I was so happy watching this movie last night. Um, I, I want to go back to the question of how serious you took yourself as, a, as an artist and just rephrase it a little bit. How serious did you take yourself as a filmmaker at the time? And how much did you see a future in this? And how much were you looking towards the next movie after this and getting real budgets? I was an ambitious filmmaker. I got variety when I was 14 years old. I had a successful puppet show career when I was 12 for children's birthday parties. So I... I had a, hopefully a sense of humor about it, but at the same time, I was serious about having a career, definitely, always. And I was working, I looked back, I thought, how did I ever get this movie made then? I mean, you know, how did we even do this? How did we get away with it? So, um, but- I know where the question comes from, because yeah. just to get a movie made, you have to be serious, even if- We were serious, I was dead serious about making it, and at the same time, I, I we were like a cell, we were like a political group, almost, of group madness that just did these, movies that were, were sort of like actions in a way. You know, it was during the yippie period and when demonstrations and, and when the yippies like Abby Hoffman used humor as terrorism, right? And I'm still for that. I think you embarrass the enemy is the only kind of terrorism I think's good. So this movie was against the tyranny of good taste, which I grew up in, certainly. And um, But at the same time, that's all in hindsight. You know, when we were making it, it was just like a kid today on the cell phone making a movie with his friends. It's this exact same spirit. You use the phrase the tyranny of taste, of bad taste. Of good taste. Of good taste. I mean, it, it, it begs to ask the question what you think of... I mean, so much of this film, there's moments where she says, let's kill Ronald Reagan's family. What do you... She's clearly, Don't take it out of context. <laughs> <laughs> but clearly re re rebelling against a conservative uh, ideology yeah. and... And well, Reagan a, wasn't even president then. Governor of California, right? Yeah. Um, if that, I guess, yeah. Yeah, he might. I, I in 1970, I don't remember. I'm not sure. But what do you say now when we're in the midst of a presidential election where the Republican candidate is someone of, that is a tyranny? Of taste? Well, he's a hair hopper. You know, it's, it's a hair hopper family. <laughs> and to me, it was really fun to watch the Republican convention because it was like, you're kidding. Did Kevin Fenderlane say no? And I like Kevin Fenderlane. So um, I personally think he's going to lose and he's destroying the Republican Party. So I'm thrilled. I don't ever rise to his But Good, keep saying it, do everything you want. I think it's great. But it's strange to not have the Republicans be the people that we get to rebel against anymore in terms, well, of, in terms of having bad taste or uh, liberal taste or anything like that. I mean, he... he, he he does not have good taste in any, in any way, nor is he that conservative socially. Well, whatever he is, it's kind of fun to watch. I know I'm sick of it. You know, I got a robocall from him in Provincetown yesterday, and I was on the other oh. line, so I didn't pick up on my landline, and I heard the voice answering machine with his voice, and I thought, where do I report an obscene phone call? <laughs> it seemed like that's what I should do, really, when I heard his voice, and it was long, too. It wasn't like a 10-minute one, and I guess I didn't have my limit on the message thing, so he went on for, t you know, two, three minutes in that voice when I was trying to have a personal phone call on the other line. <laughs> uh, going back to Multiple Maniacs, you know, a lot of the film is clearly you learning how to shoot a movie, yeah. learning how to make a movie. 
But at the same time, you wear it so proudly as an artist. Again, did you know that you were wearing that proudly as an oh, artist? Oh, I thought it was good. It was the best I could do. It looked better than the one before, Mondo Trash Show. <laughs> so uh, I, this was our big budget movie. <laughs> we could talk. Uh, no, was I could budget? go to film jail for the Zoom abuse in this yeah. film. And, like, and, and Yeah, but... I didn't know any better. I had never shot a movie. It was the first time I'd even used the equipment. So I didn't go to film school or anything. So that's what I always say. If you like it, you say it's raw. If you don't like it, you say it's amateur. But Mink Stoll said once, how could they call us amateurs? We had to do seven pages of dialogue without one mistake, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and, have, and give a rosary job at the same time. I like to see Meryl Streep do that. What did you think She'd of... She'd do it well. She'd do it well. What did you think of, uh, I mean, another filmmaker at the time who was making uh, films similar, but from a different viewpoint, I think, always, is Paul Morrissey. Especially well, Paul and I, yes, we did, because when I was making Mondo Trash Show, he was making Trash, and I didn't know it at the exact same time. And I only found out about five years ago, I made a movie called Eat Your Makeup in 66, where we had the Kennedy assassination with Divine as, Div as Jackie. He, they made one, too, that was never shown, called Still, at the same time, too. So we were, without knowing what the other one was doing, doing things very similar at the exact same time. But I was 10 years younger than all them. So I knew those movies, not still, because that had never been shown. But I would come to New York and go to the, see all those early movies, Chelsea Girls. They were huge influences on mine. Yeah. But, but um, and Paul used the same kind of sound, too, and everything, same kind of film. You know, even the color film we made with Pink Flamingos. It never faded, that ectochrome reversal color film. Cleopatra faded, but Pink Flamingos didn't. And Cleopatra was in a Hollywood vault, and mine was in my hot attic in humid Baltimore. So uh, that <laughs> ectochrome film, they ought to bring that back, I'll tell you. That you're Kodak the, film was you're, amazing. You're a big supporter of film, right? Oh, I don't care. No. I mean, you know, I, <laughs> I guess, if, I guess, if, let me check my notes. If I, if I make another film, it will certainly be digital. Yeah, because, but it's never going to go back. I love that Quentin can get away with it and Spielberg. Those are the only two that'll be able to. Good. I, I, no, I'll make it however you have to make it. I'm not a purist. And everybody asks you this, I think, in every one of your interviews, surely the last interview I, I, I did with you, I asked, it's been a while since you've, you've made a movie. And, you know, you said you've been in some development deals. I've had three development deals since Hollywood deals, which were great, you know. But you're not like... And I've written a couple books, and, you know, and I do speaking tours, and I have art... You know, I'm, I have a job. I have a calendar filled for the next two years. So, um... Will I ever make another movie? Maybe not. And if I don't, I'm fine. I have 16 movies out there. It's not like people didn't understand them. You know, as the Wizard of Oz said, I have spoken, you know. Um, <laughs> basically, I'm not some misunderstood artist, right? People got it right from the beginning. <laughs> That's how you feel about it? Yeah, yeah. I'm not cutting off my ear or anything, you know. People understood, and here's a movie that I made almost 50 years ago that is playing again. I never even expected. This is all gravy, you know. My, my dreams came true years ago. My friends go, ugh, when I say that. But it is kind of true. So this is all kind of gravy. So I, everybody treated me fairly. The underground, Hollywood, everything. The more money they give you, the more they're going to have to say. That's algebra. What is uh, what was the hardest movie you ever made? The hardest they were all hard. Every one of them were hard. You never have enough money. You never have enough time. Am I gonna make the day? Oh, this didn't turn out. It rained. They were, I never made a movie that was easy, and I don't think anybody ever would say they it was easy to make their movie. Is that sort of maybe one of the reasons as well that you're not sort of itching to, to no, make a movie? No, I I wanted to, I wanted the only genre I haven't satirized is a children's movie, and I got a great development deal for Fruitcake and. Uh, who knows, maybe I'll make it. You know, I wrote the sequel to Hairspray for HBO. It didn't happen, but ha Hairspray is now going to be the NBC uh, movie at Christmas this year. So maybe if that comes out, then I'll do the, maybe it'll get revitalized. Who knows? You know, the Hairspray in space, anything can happen. <laughs> Does that blow your mind that Hairspray has become what it has become? I mean, considering well, that Hairspray came... At, like My mind was already blown. Um, it came after polyester, right? Like yes, between yeah. polyester and crybaby. No, are you kidding? It's the gift that continues to give. Um, Hairspray has been an absolutely amazing experience. And uh, every gener everything that's happened for it has been absolutely amazing. And I think Hairspray and Pink Flamingos are exactly the same. I think Hairspray was the Trojan horse that snuck in and nobody noticed that the exact values in that are the same values I have in all my movies. Really? Yeah. Can you expand on that? Well, here's the thing. It's being done in every high school today all over the world. And... 
two men sing a love song to each other and encourage your white daughter to date black guys. I mean, it's, you know, this is in the movie. No one seems to notice. It sneaks in. And I've seen it now, politically correct, you, with a skinny black girl playing Tracy, and you just don't mention it, which is very odd. But I'm for that. I want the whole cast to be different races, different sex, and it'll be the finally the most politically correct, transgressive version of Hairspray ever done. Did you find that when you went to do Hairspray, you were, were you intentionally shooting for something more subversive rather no. than transgressive? When I made the original Hairspray, no. It was just, I was shocked we got a PG. I thought, I'll never work again. My audience is going to kill me. And even New Line said, put in the word shit or something so it gets a PG-13. I said, no, let's keep it. If you want to be surprising, let's make it what it is, a, a John Waters film that everybody could see. But I didn't do that on purpose, no. No. And you never ADR'd a shit in there or anything no. anywhere? <laughs> Was I you ever didn't. tempted? I, I, no, because I thought, no, this is the shock that it's PG-13. What was I mean, it wasn't even PG-13. It was PG. They wanted me to put in shit, so it'd be PG-13. You said that you uh, borrowed money from your father to make multiple maniacs. What was, uh, not to ask how much you borrowed from your father, but what was your budget in terms of what, what were you guys working with? My father was great. He lent me 2500 to make Mondo Trasho. I paid him back 5000 for uh, multiple maniacs. I paid him back. Then I asked him ten for Pink Flamingos. And he said, okay, he gave it to me, and I started to pay him back, and he said, all right, you didn't go to college, put this, you don't have to pay me back, put this money in your next movie and never ask me again, which was pretty great, you know, when you think about it, and I didn't, and it worked. What was the next movie after Pink Flamingos? Uh, Female Trouble. Female Trouble, you had Female that Trouble? That was 25,000. That was 25,000, and, and you Pink found... was 10. Pink was 10? 12, actually, yeah, That's with un... overruns. <laughs> That's unbelievable. Yeah, but that today would be what? It would be more. But still, yeah, it was it was cheap. It, we could make a dollar holler, as they say in Baltimore. Did any of your actors get paid? Yes, and they still, most of them that have done six or some movies with me still get a percentage of the profits, and they will for multiple maniacs, too. That is also one of the things, too. A number of the Dreamlanders uh, are still, or were still in all of your movies. Mary yes. Vivian Pierce, Mink Stoll. Mink Stoll, they were in right up to a dirty shame. They've been in all of them, yeah. And they're my dear, they're best friends in real life, too. And so do you just call them up and say, hey, I'm shooting a movie. Will you take part in it? Well, yes, basically. I mean, Mink now is a professional. She makes a lot of movies, so I would deal with an agent and talk with her. But yes. Really? Yeah. When Mink's did you, been in lots of movies. When did you have to start dealing with Mink's agent, though? Oh, when she had one. I don't know. Probably Serial Mom, maybe around there. I don't remember exactly. But, but um, Was that weird at all? Or? No. Oh, okay. No. Oh, it's better. Who wants to talk with your friends about money? That's true. Uh, let's open it up to the audience for questions. Who has a question? Hi. Uh, Thank you. What do you think the state of cinema will be like in 10, 20 years from now? The status of what? The state of cinema. The, of what, cinema? what do you think the state of cinema will be in oh. 10 or 20 years from now? God knows, you know. Uh, I don't know. I, I think it will be certainly come up with new inventions where everybody can make their own movie really, really cheaply, I think. Uh, but I don't really know. What, will people still go to the movies? Yes, I think they will. But, um, you know, I go to the movies now, but it's all people over 50. But, but still, I have a hard time turning on my TV. It's hard to turn on a television today. You need so many different controls and everything. I have a hard time. So I have to have an assistant to help me to turn my TV on. <laughs> and then I can watch it. <laughs> so I don't know. I think it will be... I don't care, really, because people say, oh, what do you want, young people want to watch it on their cell phone? I don't care. My early movies look better. You don't notice the mistakes. So uh, I don't care how people want to watch my movies or read my books or anything, as long as they do. I don't care if they read it on a tablet or a book. It doesn't make any... Technology just makes it easier for people to see your work, and that's what I'm for. It's never going to go back. It's not like I think, I'm not the kind of person who thinks, oh, it was better when I was young. No, it wasn't. You're having as much fun shutting down the government with your computer that we did banning the bomb. It's the same fun. At the same time, I will say, when I was watching Multiple Maniacs in, in my house last night by myself, I was kind of thinking, this would be really fun to watch with other people and get to look oh, at the Oh, it is better in a movie face. theater. It is better because people can howl and laugh and, yeah, and yell out stuff and all. Yeah, it is more fun, this kind of movie, definitely. But not so much at midnight anymore. I think midnight movies, it's hard because you don't have to stay up to midnight to see a movie. People can have a midnight movie in their own home. It just meant that they can smoke pot and watch movies. They can do that anywhere now, yeah. really. Yeah. Uh, next question. Hi, nice to meet you over here. Hi. Um, this is completely off topic. So, um, where did you get your socks from? 
<laughs> you know, usually I know where I got my socks. I usually get them at Paul Smith, but these were a birthday present, so I don't know where they came from. But usually Paul Smith, but these are not Paul Smith. Next question. Hi, John. Thanks for coming. Um, just one quick question, but I've watched all your movies. Is there anything that, like, was so extreme that they wouldn't let you put it in the movie after they've seen it, or...? You mean, well, I mean, well, sure. who's they? I mean, you know, I, I didn't have anybody up till Hairspray was the first movie that New Line paid for the whole movie. I raised the money for all the other ones and made, you know, I got the money, so nobody could tell me not to. But the distributors, um... No, they, I took notes. You know, I listened. The more money people give you, you have test screenings and everything. But most, all, I knew what I could put in that would work, that wouldn't be. I didn't purposely put in things to just cause myself trouble. I, I didn't put in, I mean, in Crybaby, there's a scene where she drinks all the tears she saved in a jar, which is creepy, right? But <laughs> Brian Grazier and Ron Howard, who were head of Imagine Films, they said, we know that's, you want that. So the audience is... It creeps them out, but you can keep that in. They were fair to me, you know. I had to do reshoots on a whole other scene, but I could keep the guzzling of tears in. So I think you barter on, on what it is. But but that was a sign of a touch that people expect. That when it, The only fights I had was when they try to make everybody like the movie. And even the head of the test screenings, the NRG, said to me, what's the norm we test you against? It's kind of impossible to have a test screening because they say, well, compared to this, or what did you like, what character did you like the least? And then they pick the villain. Well, you're supposed to not like them. That's the villain. But um, you can learn some things from it. It's, it's the worst when they keep the focus group there and they keep them, and they all like it and they wear them down till they finally, after 20 minutes, say one thing they didn't like. And then the next day they say, you have to change that. You know, that, or make them like it. There's no way to make them like that. I remember... The These are people that they would never talk to in real life either, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the first time I saw the uh, tear guzzling in Cry Baby, and it comes at the end of like a really beautiful song, and this really emotional, heartfelt song, and it's just wrapping up, and then all of a sudden she guzzles tears, and you go, ugh. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, no one that I know has ever saved their tears and guzzled it. <laughs> and I know some masochists. Uh, but maybe this is something for Love Anonymous. Maybe at those kind of meetings, that would be a good thing to bring up. I got this jar here. Will you share it with me? <laughs> I think we have time for one more question. Hey, John. Uh, I don't throw around the word icon too much, but you are an icon, and it's an honor Thank to have you, you here much. in the Thank studio. You. Um, sticking on the topic of Cry Baby, it's one of my favorite movies. I think it just turned 25 years old or it something might, like that. Yeah. It's crazy. Um, do you have any other fun stories coming from that set that you might have not shared before? You know, I think also it was a musical, you know, unlike Hairspray, that a Broadway musical that failed, even though we had four major Tony nominations. And they just recently did the cast album. It finally came out. So listen to it. The songs are great. They're like, girl, will you kiss me with tongue? And there's a song called Screw Loose where a girl sings about having schizophrenia. You know, it really was good. But it didn't exactly work on Broadway because it was the sexiest Broadway musical for the whole family. That was an issue. But um, so that is the thing that I remember most. With Crybaby, certainly it was not a success, the movie, when it came out. And, um, but yet today, I bet more people have seen that than any movie and I've ever made because of television all over the world and Johnny Depp. So, um, and I think Johnny's absolutely fabulous in it. And I had the most insane cast in that movie. We would walk in a restaurant with Susan Terrell, Iggy Pop, David Nelson, pa Patty Hearst. People would run. They just didn't know what to do. Any age... It made him nervous. And uh, so I have great memories of making that movie, certainly. And it was a hard movie to make. It was $11 million. It was a, it was a big musical with everything, you know, so a big Hollywood musical. So um, it was the first time ever we had trailers and all, you know, it was the first studio movie I ever made. So I have very fond memories of it. Yeah, I have to ask, what was it like working with Susan Terrell? She only made a few movies, and... She made a lot of movies. I guess that... She was yeah. the scariest woman I ever met in my life. I mean, yeah. Fat, City, uh, Fat City is one of my yeah. favorite performances of all time. I got along. Here's what she said to every person she met her. Hi, I'm Susu, and I have the pussy of a 10-year-old. <laughs> what do you say to that, you know? And I said, Susan, please don't say that to my mother. She said, why? <laughs> what was her deal? She just said that, and I doubt it was true. <laughs> I hate to challenge her on that fact, but 
It just didn't seem. I don't know. She, the she, implications <laughs> of your doubt are so funny. Yeah. She was scary. I got along with her, but she drank. You know, that was the problem. And uh, Iggy Pop had just gotten sober, and he had to do every scene next to her drunk. I felt bad for him, really. <laughs> Uh, John, Multiple Maniacs has uh, an incredible restoration by Janice Films. It's and amazing. Criterion, yeah, both. Criterion. Job. They did an amazing job. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's going to come out in theaters, right? Yeah, it opens tomorrow. It opens, it's opening at 20 theaters uh, in August. And yes, it's, it's, it's amazing to me, too, actually. But really good theaters, too. Really classy art theaters all over, right? So uh, I would say see this in a theater with an audience. It's going to be so much fun to see it in a theater with an yeah, audience. Yeah, maybe you'll get a rosary job in the theater. You don't know. <laughs> And then uh, after it comes out, you should pick up the Blu-ray or the, the DVD. Well, that's coming later. That's yeah, coming after, later. later yeah, yeah, yeah. John, thank you so much for thank being you here. So Congratulations. Much. Thank you. Thank you.